Well, welcome to another session of my myths and misunderstandings about laser technology. Today we're going to tackle a subject which um, is familiar to many of us. This stuff. Acrylic. Now, there are lots of myths about acrylic, but one of the biggest myths is which of those is cast acrylic and which of those is extruded acrylic. Well, the myth clearly says that this one is extruded acrylic because it doesn't engrave as white as this cast acrylic. Cast acrylic is known for its brilliant white engraving. I've even perpetuated the myth myself in the early days because, hey, this is what you see. So it must be fact. Or is it? This is where the myth bit comes in. As I've got older and wiser, and yes, I am very old, and just a little bit wiser, I've learnt that things are not always what they seem with this laser technology world that we live in. This stuff is clear and we can see through it. You can see what I've got here. This stuff is clear and you can see through it as well. It might seem far-fetched to say this, but effectively this is equivalent to water in every way possible. You can see through it, that's just one thing, but that's not the point that I'm making. The point is that this is like water in its solid state, ice. Take this above zero degrees C and it turns to this liquid. If we take this stuff above 160 degrees C, it turns to liquid. If we push this stuff up to 100 degrees C, we know what happens to it. It boils and it vaporizes and turns to steam. Push this to 200 degrees C and it does exactly the same. It turns to vapor and you get acrylic steam coming off. And you know what happens if you put a cold surface under steam? It will recondense again. This is exactly what you see when you get all this white haze on the surface of your engravings. It's recondensed solid acrylic. Okay, so joke over. It is similar to water in many different ways. And I'm going to show you another way that it is very similar to water. Okay, now your eyes are very easily deceived. Colour is a wonderful thing if you understand how it works. But look at this. Absolutely clear water. And what have I just done? I've turned it white. How did I do that? Why is that white? Well, the answer is very simple when you think about it, because you know what I've done. I've created bubbles in there. And bubbles are like cat's eyes in the road. They reflect the light and refract the light in all sorts of different directions. What we see is a scattering of the light that's around us, white light. There is no chemical reaction going on in there, because the only way that this material disappears is by vaporisation. So that colour is not coming from any change that we've made to the material. It's come about because we've done that. We've refracted and reflected the light in some strange way, usually with bubbles. So, what's the difference between these two materials that causes them to be different in the way in which they engrave? They both start off as methyl methylacrate. It's just a molecule, okay? And you would see it as MMA. MMA on its own is useless for us. But what we do, we take these molecules and we put them through a process called polymerization. And basically that's a chemical process that I'm not going to get involved with that basically joins all the single molecules together into a long chain so that they become a useful plastic. And then they become polymethyl methylacrylate. And that's what we buy, PMMA. Both of these materials are PMMA. So why are they acting differently? Well, the problem is really the way in which the PMMA, the polymerization process, is created and comes about. In the case of cast acrylic, we've got about 95% polymerization. It, that's the efficiency of the chains joining together, all the molecules joining together. 
But in the case of extruded acrylic, it's a little less efficient and we've only got about 90% polymerization. So technically we've got two different materials here, even though they're made from the same material base to start with, they're not the same. They might look the same, but the properties of them are different because of this change in the polymerization. Now the manufacturing process creates other small issues with it as well, but mainly it's this polymerization difference that gives us the main property differences between these two pieces of material. Can we make this cast white engraving also happen on extruded material? There is no reason why not, because look, bubbles are bubbles. It's the colour has got nothing to do with the material, as I said. It's all to do with what your eye perceives, the reflection of what you've done to this surface of this material that's caused it to give off whiteness. Okay, so we go and take a look at these under the microscope. What's causing the difference in these two colours? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the cast acrylic. And here's what my engraving lines look like. A bit weird, aren't they? I'm right down to the, if you like, the, the base material now. And I'm now going to drop the table down so that we move out further and further and further. Now, can you see all those bubbles in there? Look at them. Hundreds of them. Everywhere you look, there's bubbles. Right, we're now up above the surface and we're going into fresh air. So if I change the magnification back a little bit, drop it off a little bit, we should see them a little bit clearer. But you can see that there's still, I mean, there's huge depth there. Look, there's a hole in the bottom, but even in the bottom, and look at the hole in the bottom, it's full of bubbles. And then I'll draw down and we'll pull out of the hole and we come up towards the surface of the material. And as we come up towards the surface of the material, look, bubbles, bubbles, everywhere bubbles. As I tried to explain to you before, that's the cause of all of our whiteness that we perceive. There is scattering of light everywhere in this material. Let's compare that with the extruded acrylic. We've got hardly any bubbles in there now. Look, we've got lots of lovely solid material, melted material that's not bubbles. Now, remember, these materials melt at about 160 degrees C. So they go on to boil at 200 degrees C. And the boiling action is the thing that's creating these bubbles. We're not seeing a mass of bubbles. We're seeing a few bubbles. Now, does that mean we're not heating it up hot enough? Probably. Or does it mean we're overheating it? I think it probably means that we're not heating it up enough. We need to find ways to create more bubbles in this particular material. We need completely different settings. Using the same settings for both material is not a fair judgment, which is what everybody does when they compare cast and acrylic material. They run one test and then immediately run the same test on a different material, and here's the result. So these two materials are not the same. They don't have the same properties, because if they did, they would look exactly the same. Somehow we've got to modify our parameters to make bubbles. So when we look at that picture, what sort of conclusions do we come to? Well, if we look along the bottom of the picture there, you can see we've got liquid acrylic that's gone back and frozen into solid, but it hasn't been seriously agitated and boiled. We could change the speed, we could change the power, but equally well, the first thing that I'm gonna try is to change the focus, because you can affect things very quickly and easily with the focus, um, previously this was set at 25 millimeter air gap. It's now set to 26 millimeter air gap. We're still running at 800 millimeters a second. And that doesn't look a lot different. We might try another millimeter. Now, as I put that up to the light behind it, you can see at a glance that that's pretty rubbish. So we're now decreasing the light intensity at the surface because we've spread it over a slightly larger spot size. So that's the original focus. That was one millimeter above and that was two millimeters above. So we'll do the other thing and we'll go down a millimeter. And I think you can see that's, that's total junk. But it does show us that as we pull away from the focus, 
we lose what we're looking for. So we're looking for light intensity, the maximum amount of light intensity. So the exposure time has remained the same for all of these tests because these are all done at 800 millimetres a second. Because we've defocused the energy here, we haven't got as much damage. We're not getting the damage that we're looking for. So it looks as though we're looking for a much sharper focus that we can work with to put more intensity into these spots. So I've changed away from the one and a half inch meniscus lens that I had in here and I've now got the compound engraving set in there which gives me about a 21 millimeter focus and instead of 15 millimeter air gap I've now got down to about 11 millimeter. And I can see we're doing a lot of damage I can hear we're doing a lot of damage. But what we've got to remember now is this white that's on here is not necessarily the white that we're looking for. This is crap, look. But you'll notice it's not sticking to the job. It's just dust. When we zoom in on this, you're going to have some difficulty trying to assess what are scan lines and what aren't scan lines. Um, so what I've got here on the screen is a 0.1 pitch scale and my lines are 0.1 pitch and they also have to be around about 0.1 wide as well. OK, we'll now zoom in. The scale will now be out of focus. So there's a scale. I'd say that my measuring grid there defines the width of a cut. So what we're seeing in the middle there is a nice smooth piece at the bottom of the cut but round the edge of the cut, we've got bubbles. So wherever we look now, we're seeing more bubbles than we saw before. But I think the dark grey pieces that you see are actually my scan line, where the centre of the beam, maximum intensity, is happening. And what we see round the outside is peripheral damage from the outer lower intensity rays at the outside of the beam. We've got lots more bubbles in here than we had before, but we've now got to get more bubbles. And the way that I see we get more bubbles is to decrease the power to stop the beam cutting in as deep. Well, we could, we could try and get more of the peripheral power by changing the focus again. Right, well, here's my, here's my first test on um, cast acrylic. And I know this is cast acrylic because I've got all the striations along here from the cutting. When I put my fingernail over the edge there, there's no hint of a burr. This, on the other hand, is definitely extruded acrylic. How do I know that? There's a piece of protective film that came off of it, XT. <laughs> when I cut the end off this one, you can hear my fingernail clicking over the burr. Set that to 11.5 this time. We'll go up by half a millimetre high. So we'll draw the focus out which should decrease the intensity of the central part of the beam. Now, we're still using the original parameters. Full power, 65% on this machine, which is the full 70 watts. And we're then using the, uh, we're then using 800 millimeters a second. Now, 800 millimeters a second is a stupid amount of speed for engraving acrylic. But I've done something rather special which I will talk about shortly. But what you will notice, I cut this piece off here um, with this lens and look, I've got this condensation all along the edge of the cut. You'll notice when I start off, you'll see a very slight sort of haze build up on the surface. See it building here, look. If this was condensation that you see on here, I would not be able to do this. That's just dust. That's solid acrylic dust because it's gone up in the air. It's not been very hot and it's come right back down again. It's just settled on the surface. We'll just clean this off to make sure that there's no white dust in here, which is going to contaminate my visual assessment. So there is extruded and cast results against each other. Which one do you think is cast and which one do you think is extruded? There isn't a great deal to choose from them, is there? But all I've done is change the parameters so that I've got more intensity into the surface. 
The point I'm making here is, if you use the same parameters for testing both materials, you'll get rubbish results. These are two different materials that you have to treat differently. And I think that test there proves beyond any doubt that if we like to play with the parameters, we can get the same results as we did for cast acrylic. So I will tell you that this one at the bottom here is in fact the extruded acrylic. Now, while I'm here in the workshop, I might as well do one more test. And what I've done, I've now set this up to a 12 millimeter gap, one millimeter above the nominal focal point for this lens. So that's a lot for a very short focus lens. Okay, now again, I'll just demonstrate to you how unimportant this dust is, because look, I can just wipe it off. It's dust. When we compare that with our previous one, there is no comparison. So it's pretty critical to get the energy density at the surface spot on, to get those bubbles rather than melting or evaporation. I think that what we've got here is melting now rather than bubbles. So I'll just cut that off. And we'll take that in and look at that under the microscope. This was the last one done at 12 millimeter air gap. And as we zoom through the surface and down into the material, you'll see we've got, we've got lots of bubbles. They're not micro bubbles, but they are definitely lots of bubbles there. There's more bubbles there than we'd seen before. So let's compare that with 11.5. We seem to have a lot more bubbles on the surface. And as we drop down into the gray hole, look, at what's, look what's on the bottom of the gray hole. Lots and lots of bubbles. So we've actually got a greater density of bubbles there, different sizes, okay? But the main ones are on that edge there at the surface. We've got lots of large bubbles and they're probably the things that are really responsible for giving us the whiter color. So it's not the same, quite the same quality of bubbles as we saw with the cast acrylic, but hey, I'm not gonna work any more at it. I think the point is proven. If we can create the right sort of bubbles with the right sort of parameters, then we're going to get color. Right, well, here we are in Photoshop, and I've just recreated the text that I've been using. This would be the normal way that you'd engrave text. You'd have black characters on a, on a white background. But I've started off with black characters, and we're going to go and test this file on the machine. But this is not the file that I've been running. Let me show you the file that I've been running. Now, it involves a little bit more work, but as you can see, it produces a completely deposition-free result, even though I'm running this at full power. Now, this works also for any image that you want to put, you know, logo, if you want to put something on a sensitive material like, um, like leather in particular, it produces lots and lots of smoke and brown. You can use this same technique for creating images. It doesn't have to be text. But what I'm really saying to you is, don't just use text in any of the normal utilities where you've got an open raster engraved text. This is a bitmap piece of text that I've prepared in Photoshop. I'm going to change this text color from black, which is 000, to mid gray, which is 128, 128, and 128. You'll see that there's a little bit fuzzy around the edges. Now, the way that you can overcome that problem is to set your original image to a higher resolution. And it doesn't really matter if you go for high resolution, even if you can't print it, it will just tidy up the edges. But I'm gonna leave this like this and then show you what the procedure is. Go to image mode, and you'll see that at the moment we've got color mode. Well, we're gonna turn this to grayscale, and you won't see any difference because it's gray. Okay, so if we go and look again, mode, image, mode, you'll see that we've now got grayscale. I'm now gonna convert this from grayscale into a bitmap. Now, as far as Photoshop is concerned, a bitmap race basically means I'm going to dither it. So flatten the layers, and then we're gonna use a diffusion dither. And there we go. So I've now converted that into what you'd normally use for photo engraving. 
instead of the laser beam being on continuously, the laser beam is now operating as though it was doing photo engraving and it's switching on and off, on and off at high speed. Remember, I'm doing 800 millimeters a second and at 254 PPI, uh, that's 10 pixels per millimeter, 800 millimeters a second means I'm producing 8,000 dots per second. So the beam is on nearly continuously, but it's not continuous. And that's the key factor about this process with stopping and starting the beam. Now, in reality, your eye can't see these dots, but it makes a huge difference to the amount of energy that you're putting into the surface. You're not keeping the beam on. You're not scraping away huge depths to the surface. You're producing little dot marks on the surface, which are not causing a huge amount of solid material to be converted into steam, into vapor. Yeah. And the vapor can just escape, drift away without ever being blown or settling down onto your work. That's why I'm producing dust and not acrylic recondensation. Okay, so let's try my normal black file. So this is 70 watts at 400 millimeters a second, which would be normalish for most machines. You can already see the condensation building up here. Because we're modifying so much material and converting it into vapor. We've got a cut there that might be half a millimeter deep. So that's a lot of material that we're actually converting into vapor. Now, I've got quite a big air gap there and I've got quite a big nozzle on there. So I haven't got a huge amount of air assist blowing the fumes back down onto my job. The, the main reason for the air assist is to protect the lens. Now this debris here, look, it's just dust. Now to a certain extent we will be able to wipe this off. Look, look at the amount of actual solid recondensed acrylic that we've got. And then look at all that haze that we've got on there that doesn't come off. Look around the T. I've smeared it and we certainly don't have white letters. There's another myth blown. So this comes back to understanding the material, how it reacts and how your laser machine is operating. There are ways of producing engraved text on acrylic without all this deposition. So you don't have to mask your job or you don't have to put hard soap on it or anything else to try and stop this deposition. Don't create it in the first place. Well, that could be a little bit unfair. We don't have white letters because we're using this thin material, which we know is actually extruded acrylic. Let's do the same thing on a piece of cast acrylic without changing the parameters. Here's my selection of acrylic materials. I've got no idea where they came from. I've got no idea whether they're cast or whether they're extruded. Those with labels on generally happen to be probably quality cast products. But hey, I can't say that for certain. So how can I tell the difference between cast and extruded? Well, one major way is tolerance. Now look, I think before we go any further, you think there's only two methods, cast and extruded. I'm gonna confuse the situation a little bit by explaining something else to you. Let's look at the way that they manufacture cast acrylic. Basically, they start off with a sheet of plate glass and they put some silicon tape around the edge. The thickness of that silicon tape represents the thickness of the sheet that they're going to finish up with. They, they then just blow the debris off the surface of the glass and they put another sheet of glass on top. Then in a very highly technical way, they clamp the glass sheets together. They then put an insert in the side of the sheet and then pour hot molten acrylic in between the sheets. Now, as you can see, the void is only half full at the moment. So they finish up squashing the void to fully full by clamping the top sheet of glass under a press. Hence the dodgy tolerance on cast sheets. They then stack it so that it cools and solidifies, but then they spend hours, maybe 12, maybe 24 hours, in water and in ovens to produce this polymerization process. Then they take the clamps off. 
and there's your sheet of acrylic. It then goes into a covering, protective covering process. Job done. Let's take a quick look at the extrusion process. This man up the corner here is busy feeding acrylic pellets into the machine. And then this long tube here is basically a screw auger with a heater around it that gradually brings the uh, acrylic up to its near melting. And here you can see the actual extrusion head where the molten plastic is forced in. And then it passes, it's squeezed here between these rollers and the thickness here is the thickness of the sheet that you get out. And it then passes around these rollers, cooling down as it goes, and you finish up with the sheet, the right thickness coming out here. But it's still warm and very flexible. And then it runs down the production line, gradually cooling off and staying flat. And then you can see at the end of the line, it goes through a protective film process. But of course, it's a quick and efficient process. We haven't got all this water, all this manual operation involved. It's been very difficult trying to track down some video of this continuous casting of acrylic. But in the next few seconds when I run the video, you'll see a stream of white acrylic coming out of a, an auger or a spout, and it's dropping down onto a stainless steel belt. It looks as though nothing is happening, but you can see movement in the stream of white acrylic if you look carefully. this diagram which sort of uh, basically explains the process in fairly simple terms. So here we've got the two stainless steel belts which change thickness to change the thickness of the cast strip. It looks like a very simple process but you can see it's very very uh, capital intensive. Now until just recently I didn't really know much about this continuous casting process. Probably like you. I thought there were only two processes. But as you've seen, the difference between cast acrylic and extruded acrylic is quite significant. Where does continuous cast acrylic fit into this pattern? Is it the same as cast acrylic? Does it perform the same as cast acrylic? I honestly don't know because I can't find any information out about it. So we've got these three different manufacturing processes. We know about two of them and the third one is only a recent piece of knowledge that I've gained. I didn't realise that there was a different continuous casting process. We've looked at two pieces of material today. We know that one of them was absolutely extruded acrylic because it said it on the label. Was the other piece cell cast acrylic or was it continuous cast acrylic? How do we know? Well, let's see if we can try and narrow it down a little bit. I've already described the properties of acrylic in that you know it turns the liquid at 160 degrees C and at around about 200 degrees C it boils and bubbles and evaporates. This is called cell cast, the way that you've seen this made between two sheets of glass. Its tolerance is great for a piece of glass if you want to look through it but it's not very great for laser cutting if you want to use tight dimensions because the tolerance on thickness is plus or minus 10 percent. The thickness of cell cast can range typically between 2 and 25 millimetres. That's the void thickness between the two sheets of glass. Now the colours can be virtually unlimited because they're only working in small production batches. In addition, you can get thick cell cast because, hey, two sheets of glass, you can make them any distance apart and fill them up. But the problem is the tolerance changes quite significantly as you increase thickness. Now these thicknesses are not something that we're ever going to come across, so we can really almost dismiss those. I've got some 20 millimetre thick here, which which I've been cutting with this machine. And we'll do a little bit of that later because I want to show you something about the way that this works. But you know that's about as thick as you're ever going to work with. Then we've got our extruded acrylic. When I try and track down information about this, it's very, very vague. I mean, I can find roughly that, you know, to form this stuff, you need to be at about 150 degrees C. But hang on, 160 degrees C for normal acrylic, cast acrylic, it's turning to water at that stage, liquid. This, this stuff doesn't really turn to liquid until 190 degrees C, which is nearly the evaporation and boiling point of cast acrylic. But we haven't reached that point yet. We're nowhere near boiling. So, hang on, we're beginning to get a little bit of a 
clue here as to why we had to put more concentrated energy into our extruded acrylic because its boiling and evaporating point is probably somewhere up around 260, 270 or even 280 degrees C, much, much higher. That's a very likely the reason why when we move from cast to extruded acrylic using the same power, all we did was melt the extruded acrylic rather than boil it. We had to find different parameters to, to raise the temperature higher specifically to make this stuff boil. This cast and extruded acrylic are two different materials even though they're made from the same molecule. The way that they're bonded together causes them to have different properties. Two great things supposedly about extruded acrylic. Number one is tolerance. It's only plus or minus three percent. Generally you can get unlimited colours but you have to buy huge quantities because as you've seen this is a big long line process. It's not a simple sheet by sheet process. And then we've got this continuous cast acrylic. I can't tell you what the liquid temperature is. I can't tell you what the boiling and evaporation point is because it's not there to be found. The only sort of information that you can find with continuous cast, typically the only range of thicknesses you can get is between two and 10 millimeters. So anything above 10 millimeters is not going to be continuous cast. So the question is, is this continuous casting closer to cell casting or is it closer to extrusion? How is it going to affect the temperature and the properties of the material? The great thing about it is at two millimeters, we've still got the plus or minus 10% tolerance, but 10% is plus or minus 0.2 of a millimeter. So it's not large. Between three and 10 millimeters, we're down to a tolerance of plus or minus 5%, which is great. Problem is, we're limited to the colours normally, black, white and clear. So we've got lots of little bits of clues here as to help to maybe help us sort out which material is which. Generally with cast acrylic of any sort, it's difficult to get a polished, a flame polished edge on it as you cut it. But with extruded acrylic, you get a polished edge on it regardless of what you do to it. It seems as though it's a natural finish that you get with extruded acrylic. So we're going to try and find some genuine cast acrylic to carry out our test engraving to see whether we can make it white. So if we catch them in the light, right, look, you can see that they're both beautifully smooth. So that doesn't tell me whether this is cast acrylic or not. Because if I run cast acrylic very slowly, I can flame polish the edge. This is no-name acrylic. Let's take the film off. What tolerance variation have we got on the corners? And we'll set that to zero. And now we'll check the tolerance variation on the other three corners. Sorry, plus 0.1, 0.15, virtually nothing, because that was our reference corner, and minus 0.04. Pretty accurate as far as a piece of material is concerned. Now, I could pick up a piece of cast acrylic and it would be rubbish. So at the moment, this gives the impression this is either machine cast acrylic or it's extruded. Okay, so now here we've got a piece of white acrylic, which is about six millimeters thick, I think. Let's just check. We'll set that one to zero. We'll check the opposite corner, somewhat six inches away. And it's minus 0.5. There's half a millimeter difference in that distance there. Let's go to the other end of the sheet, which is about three feet away. Minus 0.1, mine and plus 0.1. So I don't think there's any doubt in your mind that that is definitely a piece of cell cast acrylic. And here I've got a thin strip of 10 millimeter. So let's just measure that this end, 10.7. We'll make that zero. And we'll check the other end, which is about three foot distance away, about a meter away. So it's minus 0.3. The chances are, from the dimension point of view, this is not machine cast acrylic. This is hand cast, or as they call it, cell cast acrylic. Okay, so we know we've found a piece of genuine cell cast acrylic. Let's run our test on it again without changing the parameters. We're still running exactly the same parameters, 400 millimeters a second and 65% power.
this definitely looks exactly like the myth says. This engraves white and this doesn't engrave white. Catch the light on them slightly differently and there's less of a difference. This is definitely the basis of the myth. The fact that we can use the same power on different materials and get different results. So remember we've just checked the corners of this piece of material and it looked as though it should be a piece of extruded material because it was really really super quality. It may well be machine cast acrylic. Let's see how genuine cast acrylic and genuine extruded acrylic compares with this material. I don't think there's any doubt that probably this is machine cast, this is cell cast and this is very very definitely extruded. The cell cast and the machine cast look pretty equable so I think probably the properties of this stuff and this stuff might be the same but hey we won't really know that until we start cutting because there can be a big difference in the cutting properties of these materials. But cutting well, I think that's a whole new bucket of myths which I shall have to tackle in another session.